Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I want to read a passage there before we begin with our lesson. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 says the following. Jesus says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 3, Jesus rebukes those who prove to be false disciples. He says to those who claim to be disciples uh, because they spoke in His name at some point, they did signs and miracles, He says to them, I, I never knew you. you know, we expect that uh, unbelievers and ungodly ones will be rejected. We kind of expect that. The Bible's pretty clear about that. They're easy to spot, but it's always difficult to accept the idea that there may be some who claim to be disciples, who call themselves Christians, who will also be rejected by the Lord as well. That's a little harder idea to, uh, to accept. I would think that this would cause us to examine ourselves a little more carefully. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 15, see if we, if we are in the faith. You know, he challenges members of the church. Examine yourself, see if you're in the faith. So a good way to perform this examination is to look at ourselves, of course, in light of the epistles of John, certainly in light of the word, but specifically in light of the epistles of John the Apostle. Uh, I believe that more than any other writer, John is very sensitive to the idea of who is and who is not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. When we examine John's criteria, we see that it's very different from the requirements put forth by a lot of different groups today who feel that they alone are the true disciples. You know, a good way to figure this out, what does the Bible say about who's the true disciple? Now, Obviously, we don't have time to you know, read and outline, summarize each of these epistles, but all three letters combine to provide a blueprint that helps us discern the characteristics of a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. So without further ado, let's get into a couple of those. First of all, according to John, a genuine disciple does not practice sin. A genuine disciple does not practice, important word, sin. John begins his first letter with this statement and repeats it throughout the other two. He expresses this idea in a variety of ways. For example, in 1 John chapter 2, and if you want to go to the, the epistles of John, I'll be reading you know, several passages in there so you can follow along. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 3, he says the following, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in the same manner that he walked. He says this in 1 John 2, 3 and 6. He says it in 1 John 1, 6 and 7. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. He says it again. I want to pick a different epistle. Uh, in uh, 2 John, in 2 John, verse 6. He says, and this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And then just to make the idea complete, go to 3 John, uh, 3 John verse 11, he says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. And so the bottom line is the same in whatever passages that you read. Uh, genuine disciples do not practice evil. Now, he doesn't say that they are without sin. He doesn't say, he doesn't set the bar that high. He doesn't say genuine disciples never sin. It's not what he says. He says that their genuineness is seen in the way that they react to sin. Let's read another passage, this time in 
First John chapter one, verse eight and nine, a little more familiar to us. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in it. So it doesn't matter how much Bible you know or what position you have in the church, how long ago you were baptized, a genuine disciple is consciously and aggressively dealing with his or her sins and he knows what they are. That's the thing. Genuine disciples, they're not perfect, but they know where they're imperfect most of the times. The hypocrisy or the hypocrites don't even know what their sins are. They're usually clueless about those. So genuine Christians, according to John, recognize their sins, they acknowledge these things, they turn away from their sins, they accept forgiveness, and they get on with their lives. I tend to see sometimes the genuine disciples do not make a life out of worrying about their sins. They deal with them. When they fail, they seek forgiveness. They ask for help, empowerment to overcome these things, but they move on. They move on. A great example, of course, is David. David and Bathsheba, when, when, when he sinned with her, she conceived the child. God told him that that child would not survive and he prayed and he mourned for that child and once that child finally died, he stopped mourning, he stopped weeping. He just went on with his life, right? That child can't come back, he said, I'll go to him but he won't come to me. Did he sin? Oh, terribly, terribly, all kinds of terrible sins. But he received forgiveness and he moved on with his life. A genuine disciple doesn't um, uh, become overwhelmed with sin, doesn't practice sin, a genuine disciple deals with sin and moves on with his life. Uh, another thing that John says about genuine disciple, a genuine disciple keeps the teachings of Christ. Now these letters were written because false doctrine was infiltrating the church at that time and John was exhorting them to base their estimate of the teachers on the message that they brought, not their message, uh, not their method. Let's look again at 1 John, this time in chapter four, beginning in verse one. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. You know, in our world today, we, we judge the value of something many times by its size. You know, how big is it? You know, whenever I go somewhere uh, to, to teach or to preach or even to visit and somebody finds out that I'm a minister or something like that, and they say, oh, you're a minister. And those of you who are preachers know what's coming. Invariably, the next question will be, which church do you preach? They want to know which church you preach for. And then the third question uh, is always the same. The third question, so how big is your congregation? <laughs> what does that matter? <laughs> but it's always a question. People want to know how big is your congregation because somehow that will place some sort of value on you as a, as a minister. Um, people judge the value of something by its speed or technical perfection or the results that it produces. That's why TV evangelism, for example, is so powerful. It's full of slick imagery and success-oriented uh, uh, success scenarios. You know, the modern approach to religion and church growth is to build an organization around a consensus of what people want, what people need. You know, the democratic church model, it's what I call it, everybody gets a say. It fits the profile of our society where everybody has a right to say and be whatever they want, whatever they feel. And no one has the right to deny them of that, of that thing. The genuineness of our Christianity, however, is not determined in this way. 
Go to 2 John this time. 2 John, verse eight and nine. He says, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So we stand or fall on Jesus' word and His word alone. In John, John the Gospel, chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus says, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke will judge him at the last day. That's pretty clear. There's not a whole lot of ways that you can twist that to mean something else. Jesus is saying, my word, you'll be judged based on my, on my word. So our sincerity, our acceptance as individuals and churches are not based on which periodical uh, uh, approves or disapproves of us or how large our church grows to be or how media wise we are, and you all know that I don't have an ax to grind about media, you know, that's, what, that's what we do a lot of here. We think media is a great tool, but we're not judged by that. We're not judged based on if other churches cooperate with us or not. The genuine disciple knows and teaches and obeys the words of Christ, whether it is fashionable or not, whether it hurts the budget or not, whether it rattles the, traditional, uh, the traditionalists in their comfort, or it rains on the progressive parade. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is that Jesus said that we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. And here's the punchline for what I'm trying to get across tonight. He then says, teaching them to observe all the command, all that I commanded you. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We all know the beginning part, right? We all know that part. Go into all the world, you know, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Of course, we know that part's important. It's how you make disciples. But that second part's very important too. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. We don't just teach the words of Christ. We are to teach that disciples are to obey the words of Christ. There's two parts to that. You know, Sunday school, Bible school, VBS, all those efforts that we make to teach children, young people, it's not enough just to upload the information about the Bible. Who was Moses? How many commandments there were? Memorize the, you know, the minor prophets, I mean the titles of the books of the minor prophets. That's all good. That's all information that needs to be loaded in. Because people need to have some sort of reference point so that they can learn. But that's not enough. We also have to teach and be serious about teaching the idea that we need to obey those things. We need to put those things into practice in our lives. Children from an early age have to be taught that they must obey the words of Christ, not just know the words of Christ. We might have a little less problem uh, you know, with the younger generation if we put more emphasis on the obedience part. Obedience to Christ is the final measure, of course, of uh, being a true disciple. Jesus says it. He says, he's the one that tells us, uh, that's how we'll know. You obey my word. And then one other criteria, genuine disciples, don't practice sin. We're not perfect, but we don't practice sin. We practice rather obedience to the words of Christ. And then another important factor, a genuine disciple loves his brother. I know it's, it's not easy, you know, I, mean, the, I mean, so many books, so much information, you could make 203 points about what's a genuine disciple. But I feel if we have these down, that we don't practice sin, that we make the effort to obey Christ, and that we have love for his brother, the things that we're learning and the things that we're practicing are actually making a difference in our lives, cultivating in us true discipleship. You know, the definitive expression of a righteous life and a true understanding and response of Christ's teaching is seen in one's attitude towards the brethren. Jesus established this as a basic test 
for true discipleship. He's the one that said this. This is how all men will know that you are my disciples, in the way that you love one another. John 13, 35. And John echoes this statement in each epistle. So in 1 John, go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And then a little later in chapter three, again 1 John, this time chapter three verse 14, he says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. And then in 2 John, 2 John verse five, he says, now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And then third John, in case there's any, <laughs> any reason to doubt, in verse five, he says, beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. So we need to understand that righteous living and sound doctrine, these are expressions of love towards God and not ends towards themselves. You know, if I struggle against sin, uh, it, it's not because I want to be self-righteous or sanctimonious in front of other people, but because in doing so, I show my love for God who saved me from sin. I fight against the things that my flesh wants to do that I know are wrong. I fight against that because it's my way of saying to God, I love you, God. It's the thing that I actually own that I can actually give. You know, I give him money, but he gave me the money. <laughs> you know. I make an effort with my body to do something, to serve in some way, to speak, to teach. But he gave me my body. He gave me all of that. But he doesn't give me the sin. And he doesn't send the seduction of temptation. And my willingness to do what is right, my willingness to conquer, my willingness to say no to those things, they're the purest forms of love that I can offer to my Savior because they're uniquely mine to give or not to give. We are careful not to even appear to sin because we always want to appear to love God that I overcome sin and resist it and say no to it, this, that's my love for God. Even when I am alone, even when no one else in the world would ever know, He knows. And my effort to not even appear to be in any type of compromising situation or sinful situation, that's my love of the brethren. That's how I can love them giving them that witness. If I am scrupulous about doing Bible things in Bible ways, in making sure that I don't violate God's word in what I teach or what I do, it's not because I'm a legalist or I'm narrow-minded, it's because of my respect for God and His word. And most importantly, we need to understand that the end result of sound doctrine and righteous living is a loving heart, not, not legalism or traditionalism. What does Paul say? He says, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a, a clear conscience. First Timothy chapter one, verse five. Think about that. The goal of our instruction, everything we're teaching you is leading you to what? is leading you to, to, to love and to do so with a clear conscience. You know, John gives an example of a, a brother who demonstrates his understanding of Christ's teaching. How? By his love of the brethren in, in, second, in 3 John uh, verses uh, 1 to 6. 
Let's read that, shall we? I read a little portion, let's put it in context. It says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth, that is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. What's he doing? He's offering hospitality. That's what he's doing. And John is saying, you know, I, I'm glad to hear that you're walking in the truth. What truth? Well, the truth that you're a genuine disciple and you're demonstrating that genuineness in the way you're loving the brethren. You know, the genuine Christian is the loving Christian. The gospel is what brings people into the church, of course, but it's the love of the brethren that keeps them in the church and bears witness that the church is truly of Christ because the church of Christ is the church of love. We could take the sign down outside and instead of saying you know, Choctaw Church of Christ, we could just change the sign and put Choctaw Church of Love. And then the second thing that I've mentioned before, sinners are welcome here. Because that's what we're supposed to be. That's what the teaching is leaning. If the teaching that we are receiving as a whole leads us to the point where we reject all other groups and we cut off relationship with the brethren and so on and so forth, well, we're something wrong somewhere. The teaching of the gospel is supposed to open up our hearts, not shrink our hearts. So we don't have to worry and wonder if the Lord will know us and accept us when, when we come before Him in judgment. John tells us that you can have confidence that you are a true disciple, a, a genuine disciple, so long as you believe right, live right, love right. Basic as it gets, right? So this evening I, I encourage all of us to examine ourselves in light of John's epistles and see if we are the true disciples. You know, don't let some person or group determine this. Let the word of God determine it. And it's a good exercise. It's not meant to make us feel guilty. Simply to shed the light on where are we at? How am I doing? So examine your conduct and decide to begin dealing with sin as a true disciple would. Confess, abandon them. You know, people don't always have to come forward to do that, but they do need to deal with their sins because when Jesus comes, we'll all have to come forward, so to speak, to be judged. Nobody will be able to just sit back, watch the others. Most of the coming forward that I've done in my life has been to me. <laughs> it's been coming forward while looking in the mirror and saying, you're such a liar, you didn't tell the truth. You need to work on that. And we need to examine our resolve to submit to Christ's teachings and put them into practice to the degree that we're able. Remember, it's not the one who hears the word, it's the one who does the word. That's the true disciple. You know, in the opening verse there, where Jesus said, many will say, in other words, there are a lot of talkers out there. It's the doers I'm looking for, not the talkers. And then of course we need to examine our, listen, it's not I, I examine my love, we need to examine our capacity for love. What kind, you know, in some of my own prayers, I, I, in my praying to God, I, I'm not, I don't say, Lord, let me love more, or I, my, I put it in a different way. I say, dear God, please, please expand my capacity for love. Open me up. Let me have a bigger warehouse for love, for people, for differences, for things, for insults, for offenses. Give me some more storage space where I can kind of store that stuff up. Make sure that I don't grow older and old with a shrinking heart. The body may be shrinking and the, the, you know, everything else may be falling apart, you know, but hopefully the heart the heart is getting bigger. 
the heart is more malleable, the heart is more Christ-like, more open. And that may mean different things for different people. It may mean you know, offering more hospitality or resolving a conflict or begin serving or begin giving or begin becoming faithful to service. You know, it's different for all people. If we do these things, we'll grow in our confidence that we are truly disciples of Christ and we'll find peace and security in our walk with God. What is the point? What is the point of being a disciple of Jesus Christ and walking around feeling guilty all the time? What is the point of that? <laughs> or feeling I'm not good enough. No point to that. Of course, we always ask everyone to examine themselves to see if they have taken the initial step to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that first step, of course, is to acknowledge one's faith, one's belief that Jesus is the Son of God, to make that decision, that repentance decision. I will change my ways, change my attitude towards sin. And of course, to be immersed in the water, to be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of sins and that we might receive the Holy Spirit. And so we make that invitation now, of course, as we do at every public meeting and every opportunity. And if you're subject to that, please, by all means, the water is ready, the elders are here to pray, ministers are here to, to baptize you, please make that decision. But if you also need to make the decision to be a more genuine disciple, even if it doesn't mean coming forward, make that decision. Make that decision. Be true and real with yourself about yourself before God. So if you need to respond to our invitation this morning in any way, uh, this evening rather, please come forward now as we stand and sing.